Hey everyone, welcome back. So in this video, we'll be talking about Moran's eye, which is a measure of spatial correlation. Now let's just show you an example right away, just to get an idea for what kind of questions can be answered using Moran's eye. So what I've shown here is the election map for the 2016 presidential election in the United States. So you see that the red states voted for Donald Trump and the blue states voted for Hillary Clinton. So as you can see, there's a little bit of clustering here and there. You can see some areas where red states cluster together and some areas where blue states cluster together. So a natural quantity that you might want to measure is the magnitude of this clustering through the United States. So that would help answer the question of do red states cluster together? Are red states more likely to be near other red states and blue states near other blue states? Or is it more random geographically? So that's the type of question that can be answered with Moran's eye. Now instead of going into that example, which is going to be very complicated, let's look at a smaller example and you'll be able to see how we can answer the initial question pretty easily. So rather than just give you the formula for Moran's eye, you know on this channel I don't like to just throw formulas at you because I don't see that as an effective method of teaching. Instead we'll be looking at two examples and then we'll be building up the formula so that by the end you're going to have the formula but also the understanding about what each component means. Okay. So let's pretend like we're looking at the same example, except with a much smaller country. So let's say that this is our country. It has eight states, so each state is each of these cells. And a one, let's say, means that that state voted Republican in the last election. And let's say zero means that it voted Democrat in the last election. So we're going to look at two possible scenarios here and look at what the Moran's I is for each one. So our first scenario is up here. So the states are numbered with the green values. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and the same numbering down here for the second scenario. Now we see in the first scenario, there is a very obvious clustering. All of the states that voted Republican or have ones in them are to the left, and all of the states that voted Democrat or have a zero in them are to the right. So we would expect Moran's I to be rather high. Just a quick note, Moran's I is bounded between negative 1 and 1, so that the interpretation doesn't change based on whether your values are measured in feet or meters or whatever other units you might have. So we have this case where we'd expect Moran's I to be rather high towards the 1 side because there is a strong positive spatial correlation. And what that means in layman's terms is that there's a strong indication that states with similar voting patterns cluster together. Now let's look at the bottom example. The bottom example is actually the exact opposite scenario. We see that if we have a Republican state or one that has a one in it, then it's going to be bordered by Democrat states that have zero in them and vice versa. If we have a Democrat state that has zero in it, it's going to be bordered by Republican states. So this is a prime example of negative spatial correlation. And we don't see this much in real life and it doesn't get talked about too much, but I do want to give it to you so you can have the full picture. Negative spatial correlation means that the value at any given geography tends to be very far from the value at neighboring geographies. So it's even difficult for me to come up with a natural example of this because we typically think of either having a positive spatial correlation where similar values cluster together or having no spatial correlation where there's no real pattern in the geography you're looking at. But thinking about having a negative spatial correlation is a little bit more difficult. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It just means that we think about a little bit less. But this is a graphical example of a negative spatial correlation where the value at any given geography is the opposite or very far from the value at neighboring geographies. Now just to reiterate again, we have n states here. So our n is equal to 8 and that's just the number of units that you have. If you're looking at the map of the United States, then your n would be equal to 50 because we have 50 states. So the last component you'll need before we start the calculations of Moran's I is to define a weight matrix. And this ends up being actually a very important part of what your Moran's I values are going to be. This weight matrix, where each entry is given by W, I, J, where I goes from 1 to N and J goes from 1 to N, basically tells the story of what is the weight or what is the connectedness of geography I to geography J. For example, if I'm looking at geography 1 and 2, that would be these first two cells here, then I'm going to give that a weight of 1 because those two states or those two geographies border each other. However, if I'm looking at geography 1 and 3, I'm going to give that a weight of 0 because those geographies don't border each other. Another example would be looking at geography 1 and 5. Those two do border each other spatially, so I'm going to give that a weight of 1. So this weight matrix completely tells a story about what is the connection or strength of connection between one geography and any other geography that's in your situation. So the weight matrix I've chosen for this example is that very simple one where if you see a state having a border, not a diagonal border, but either a horizontal or vertical border with another state, we're going to give that weight 1. 
And if they don't have such a border, I'm going to give that a weight of zero. So that's the story that's being told mathematically over here. Now that's not the only way you can define a weight matrix. For example, you can also do something like a k nearest neighbor weight matrix where you're going to give the five nearest neighbors or three nearest neighbors of a geography a weight of one. Or you might have a decaying weight matrix where the nearest neighbors get a weight of something near one. But as you get further away, the weight is not zero, but it is going to zero. So for example, the weight between one and four would be low in that case. So there's a lot of ways you can define this weight matrix, and that's going to impact the final calculation of Moran's I. So the way you define this weight matrix is an important factor in the final values, okay? But anyway, now that we have our weight matrix defined, and by the way, this big W is just going to be the sum of all of the values in my weight matrix, and that's going to be equal to 20. Quick note, why is it going to be equal to 20? Because if we look at the situation and you count the number of pairs of bordering states, you find that there are 10 pairs and each pair is symmetric. So for example, the weight matrix contains a one for state one connected to two. And if you look at the transpose element or the matching element on the other side of the weight matrix, that's also a one. So there's 10 pairs times two, and we get 20 as the total sum of all the elements in the weight matrix. And we're gonna call that variable big W. So now that we have the whole situation set up, we're ready to go ahead and just do the calculation and explain why this calculation intuitively does capture the spatial correlation. So I've broken it down for you in three easy steps. The first step is to compute X bar. X bar is simply just the mean across the entire geography of the variable you care about. Here the variable we care about is easy, it's binary, either one if the state voted Republican and zero if the state voted Democrat. So we see that the mean would be one half because if I add up all these binary variables in either case, I'm gonna get four and there's eight states total. So four over eight is one half. So we have X bar is equal to one half. So the next step, step two is to compute the total variation in our eight state country based on how far each value is away from that mean we just computed. So that is given mathematically down here. So what we're doing here is going through each state from one to N and we're simply doing the xi of that state, again, that's either one or zero, minus the mean we just calculated and squaring it. So this is a sum of squared differences between each state's Democrat or Republican value and the mean value. Now notice that this doesn't take anything into account just yet about the weights between these states or the fact that one state borders another. This is simply just the total variation, a measure of how much variation there is total in the entire geography. So we see that if we do this calculation, we get two. So the last step and the step that's most interesting and makes this truly a spatial correlation rather than just a regular correlation is that we take that weight matrix into account. So what we're doing here is summing over every ij pair. That's what these two sums are doing. And for each ij pair, we're computing the following value. We're first going to compute this value. We're going to compute xi minus x bar times xj minus x bar. So you might have seen something similar when you're doing a correlation or a covariance calculation. And this is basically measuring whether state i and state j's difference from the mean are in similar or opposite directions. For example, let's say that xi was Democrat and xj was Republican. In that case, we would have a 1 here and a zero here, this quantity would be positive one half and this quantity would be negative one half so that we would have a negative one fourth total. And the fact that that's negative tells us that these two states are on opposite sides of the mean. So they're not similar. On the other hand, if we had two Republican states like one and one, then we would have one minus a half and one minus a half. And so we would have one fourth. And the fact that one fourth is positive would tell us that these two states do lie on the same side of the mean. So this part is basically just computing whether or not these two states we care about. And again, we're looping over every pair of states here. And each time we're looking at two states, we're seeing if these two states do match up in terms of where they are relative to the mean. Now here's the most important part. We take that measure, whether it's positive or negative or near zero, and we weight it by the corresponding entry WIJ in the weight matrix. Now why is this important? Because it adds that very necessary spatial layer to the story. It basically says that, okay, you might have that two states aren't similar. For example, one is Republican and one's Democrat, but I really only care about that as much as their weight. For example, let's say those two states don't border. Let's say we're looking at state one and state four so that we would have a negative value when we do this part of the computation. The question is, should I care about that? And their weight is zero because they don't border. So according to my weight matrix I created here, their weight is zero. So I actually don't even care about that term at all. Now compare that with whether I'm looking at state one and state two so that I get positive one fourth in this part here. 
The question is, should I care about that? Their weight is one because they do border, so that does get included in this term. So you see why this term, even though it looks a little bit complex, does exactly the job that we need. Because these second two terms compute the strength of similarity for any pair of states that we see in our geography. And the first term weights that strength by how close together these states are literally, like geographically. So if these two states are really close geographically, their weight's going to be really high. And we put a big emphasis on this term here. However, if those two states are very far apart, we would expect their weights to be very low. And so we don't put a big emphasis here. So this here is computing the variation between states, but weighted by how close those states are geographically to each other. And if we do that literal calculation for the top example here, we see that it is 8 times 1 fourth. Where does that come from? Again, there are 10 pairs of neighboring states here. So for example, here's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So there are 10 pairs of neighboring states here, and each one is symmetric. So really there's 20 pairs of neighboring states if you look at it from the side of one state versus a different state. Now eight of these pairs are connecting ones to ones. That means that we have eight times one fourth, because the one fourth is what's gonna come out if you do this xi minus x bar, xj minus x bar, and xi and xj are both one. Similarly, eight of these pairs are connecting zeros to zeros, and we get the exact same calculation here. Four of these pairs are connecting ones to zeros. Where are those four? We have one, two, and they're both symmetric, so we have three and four. So we have four where the measure of covariance is going to be negative one-fourth. And so if we do this whole calculation, we get three for this step three for the top one, and we can do a very similar calculation for the bottom one. It's actually much easier because every pair you can look at is connecting a one to a zero. So we simply get 20, negative one fourth, so we get negative five on the bottom. Phew. So we're actually all done doing our calculations. Hopefully that you understood the calculations, but more importantly understood the intuition behind why we are computing each of the values in these steps. The last thing we have to do is just put them all together, and this is the final formula for Moran's I. So Moran's I is given by big N over big W. Big N is again the number of states we have, eight, and big W is the sum of all the entries in the weight matrix, 20. These are simply just normalization factors, just so that the final Moran's I is bounded between negative one and one. And then we do step three divided by step two. Now let's quickly think about why that makes sense. Remember, step two was the total variation not taking into account weight or geographical similarities between states at all. That's just how much variation is there in my country overall. So that becomes our denominator. Step three was how much variation is there, but now I do care about whether that is variation between states that are close together or very far apart. So we see that it's very natural to do step three's value divided by step two's value, because now we kind of get a measure of the fraction of variation that is attributed to states that are close together. So we do step three over step two, and we do these calculations, and we get that it's three-fifths for the top example, and we get negative one for the bottom example. So this does totally match up to our understanding. This negative one for the bottom example, because this is a prime example of negative spatial correlation, and three-fifths for the top example is very close to one. In fact, the only reason it's not exactly one is because I have such a small example. If you took this example of eight states and made it huge, then you would get this approaching pretty much one. So the last couple things I'll say is the real applications of Moran's I. Again, this negative spatial correlation case is not talked about as much because it's harder to find real world examples. So a lot of times you'll be checking whether there's positive spatial correlation versus whether there's zero spatial correlation. Zero spatial correlation, although I didn't do an example, would be where if these ones and zeros are pretty much randomly interspersed. There is no connection to geography. And if that were the case, then you would get spatial correlation around zero. So a lot of times researchers are looking at a map of something, whether it is the election or whether it's heights or whether it's population densities in given city areas. And they're really asking the question about is there a statistically significant positive spatial correlation here, or is it really just zero? And if you find that there is a positive spatial correlation there, then you can start saying that, okay, we do see clustering of population densities here by geography or election by geography and so on. So hopefully this helped you understand Moran's eye, this very widely used measure of spatial correlation. Please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. I'll see you next time.